I mentioned at the beginning that I would talk a little bit about global health impact. I am not an epidemiologist. So I am rushing in where perhaps fools fear to tread at this point. But I want to say a few things because I think the issues with blood pressure measurement, blood pressure control are, are important enough worldwide that I believe it needs a better perspective, especially from our particular ability to see the future here in the US. And the growth in adults, 60 years of age, the growth of high blood pressure, and just the growth in the number of patient people age 60 and older worldwide in the population at large, is shown to you here. The world populations are surviving to an older age now, whether you're in Africa, Asia, or wherever you are in the world. So it represents, because age-related comorbidities are age-related, and if the populations live longer, then you see more. And when you look at the distribution by age of populations, watch what happens to the bars on the left and the bars on the right. Bars in the middle will flatten, but here's 1950, here's the year 2000, and look at that bar way over on the right, the number of people at an extreme of age where things like osteoarthritis, heart failure, high blood pressure, and other comorbidities become just progressively greater is substantial. And that pop portion of the population is growing, even as we sit here or stand here or whatever, uh, listening to this this morning. One other aspect that comes with age, but it comes at a younger age now, is the growth in girth that is seen. We, unfortunately, in the US are kind of leading the world when it comes to the, ep the epidemic of obesity. But other countries, as you can see here, whether it's the UK, Mauritius, Australia, Latin America, whatever, they're catching up over time. And that happens to be not only true in high income countries or developed countries, like the upper parts on the left here, where the boxes are blue um, for men, uh, reddish for women, <laughs> the upper part shows that over time it's still, it's still growing. But even in the lower income countries at the bottom half of this graph, it's also growing there as well. And it turns out that it's not necessarily something that hits you after the age of 30. It's also happening in our young folk as well. And this, these kind of data that you're seeing here, which is the age standardized prevalence of obesity, where the definition is a BMI of 30. And this is a, I mean, perhaps a Western bias. And I'll show you data to show waist circumference may be the more important thing here, not necessarily the relationship weight to height. But you can see here that the number of places in the world where more than 25% of the population fits the threshold value of 30 kilograms per meter squared or higher for their body mass index, pretty impressive. Especially here when you look at women, this was men, this is women, notice a little bit more red there. So just looking back in the US, this is partly an issue of access to excess, but it's also partly an issue of physical activity. Our physical activity levels are also declining and our use of heavily sweetened beverages and high caffeinated beverages is also on the rise as well. So we have a variety of issues at play here. And one of the consequences of this growth in obesity is not just the blood pressure associated with it. We know blood pressure is associated with weight, but more importantly, the diabetes epidemic is going to worsen unless we're able to stem the tide of this here. We're seeing, for example, changes in diabetes rates from the year 2000, where we have data to the projected year of 2030, going up dramatically in North America, in the European Union, over there on the right, here in Latin America, in Africa. You're almost at the top of the list in Africa. It's just a tiny bit headed here by the middle Eastern countries with a couple percent difference between the two. But Sub-Saharan Africa, the increase is predicted to be 261% in the 30 year period from 2000 to 2030. And it's all over. Notice nowhere in the world is it falling. It's rising everywhere in the world, no matter which continent or which continental segment you pick here. And one of the aspects that has just been, hmm, to me, has been that Worldwide, the population prevalence is falling for whites worldwide, picking up dramatically for Hispanics. Black, um, African, for example, is reasonably stable and Asian is growing. So these are the challenges, if you will. And the issue about waist circumference, which I've alluded to a couple of times here, 
is this slide just fascinates me. I wish I could just spend the entire rest of the time talking about the difference in the onset or the incidence of diabetes in populations where you measure the waist circumference and you look at the likelihood of developing the incidence rate um, per 100. This is not per 1,000 patient years. This is per 100 patient years. So these are actual percents on the um, y-axis there. And we, I drew a line here across the fourth percentile level. So the likelihood per 100 patient years is 4% for whites who have a waist circumference over 47 inches or 120 centimeters. Look at the same bit of data for the Chinese. Their fourth percentile, where 4% over 100 patient years are going to develop diabetes, occurs eight inches lower, 20 centimeters lower. So the Chinese tend to be one of the highest risk populations in the world for the relationship between girth, waist circumference, and incident or developing them. You didn't have it in the first place, diabetes. And more data, if you will, just on the epidemiology of the other consequence of weight, which is high blood pressure. And I'm probably spending way more time than the global impact perhaps deserves in a talk generically about high blood pressure, but I don't think we can emphasize it enough that the likelihood of seeing more levels, more increase in blood pressure in our populations, wherever we are in the world, is going to continue. Thus, the ability to measure it, measure it correctly, and manage it are absolutely paramount public health issues. This looks at the relationship between a, being aware of high blood pressure, so it's a 10-year increment between the year 2000 and the year 2010, looking first at awareness on the left of your screen, that pair of three bars and three bars, gray, green, and red, gray, green, and red, 2000 versus 2010. You can see that whether you're in a high or low income country, the improvement in awareness has been marginal, but definitely there. Treatment a little bit so, but overall control still lagging somewhat behind. And that's the area of opportunity and where, the place where I think we need to focus a little bit on our improvement worldwide. These are just data to show you numbers associated with making the non-communicable disease, the NCDs, really on the radar screen. There are four main NCDs that the World Health Organization has identified. You know, the World Health, the WHO has, thank the Lord, has shifted its emphasis a little bit from being mainly concerned with infectious diseases and things like that, to understanding that cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and chronic lung diseases are extremely important worldwide, particularly as people do survive these infectious disease burdens. And so this is just data to emphasize that we're aware of that, so is the WHO. Twice now, or a couple times now, I've alluded to this access to excess. So on the left, you see the, the relationship between our, perhaps our forebears, uh, the hunter-gatherer type, reasonably trim body mass look, um, a diet that is agrarian, relatively high in potassium, relatively low in sodium, and then the shift or evolution, if you will, to the what we call the couch potato, the gentleman sitting in the chair holding a sugar-sweetened beverage in his left hand with a variety of carbohydrates, salt and fatty acid-laced snacks right within reach so he doesn't have to actually get up and walk to the kitchen to get them. On the right-hand side of the screen is an interesting phenomenon that I've had the fortune working with this INET group that are looking at chronic kidney disease worldwide, story for another day. But the issue about the distribution, just the distribution of blood pressures in a population really begs the question of what is hypertension? I mean, is hypertension a single definition that works in the United States, in Cameroon, in the UK, in India, in China, in Japan, and other places? And the answer is probably not. And there's a great line from the, uh, of, um, uh, the recent publication from Cameroon that I think really uh, gilds this lily well. This particular slide here shows you in the solid lines with the dark circles, the distribution of systolic blood pressure in London civil servants. This is a older data from Jeffrey Rose, uh, it's from the 80s. But on the left is the same phenomenon in a different, more, more agrarian, more rural uh, population, this being Kenyan nomads. But notice that even though the population has shifted to a mean that, or at least a median value that's around 120 compared to around 130 or so, the shape of the curve is similar. 
So that's the issue. Within a population, there are always factors that determine who's on the right-hand side of that skew and who's on the left-hand side of that skew. And this brings up that whole public health perspective that when you look at the determinant factors on the right-hand side, these are things that, that help to understand what determines the nature of that spread, the Gaussian spread and blood pressure levels in a population, and how it shifts depending upon where you are in the world. From a public health perspective, you can see on the left-hand side some things that you can't necessarily change, which are race, gender, geography, et cetera. But things on the right-hand side, you can make a difference in, and those are the areas of potential opportunity. Every time you talk about blood pressure, particularly in a, in a fashion where it's, it's an interactive rounds kind of thing, you always have to mention that it's an expensive thing to both manage, but not to manage well. Because at least in the US, and this is data from the US, our Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is the graph on the left-hand side of your screen. And the graph on the right is just more of the same data. Bottom line, high blood pressure and the cardiovascular consequences of high blood pressure and the other cardiovascular risk factors are expensive. And the best way to manage this is not to let it happen, or at least not to let it happen at a relatively young age. So prevention is a key issue here. And this, this shows that we've been making some inroads, but we're still not there. And a lot of the improvements in the cardiovascular disease mortality in the US occurred because we have reasonably effective means of trying to educate the population in general for the heart healthy kind of things, such as the dietary intakes of high energy foods and the usage of salt. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, but let me just give you the bottom line with this, and that is that when you are able to treat and control a population of patients with high blood pressure, whether it's the National Health and Nutrition Exam Survey groups, or whether that's the group you see here on the slide, or whether it's in a large health maintenance organization like the Kaiser Permanente Group in the U.S., when you actually set a goal, identify who's above that goal, treat them with medication, bring them back and assure that they've been titrated and managed well, you can get reasonably good blood pressure control. That's the issue. Blood pressure is a tractable vital sign. It does change when you pay attention to it. 